them and they accurately put it into the Word of God. And, and it's been given to us as our guidebook or our, role, our, our, uh, our rule book. How, how do we live our lives? And uh, it's our job. Paul tells Timothy, it's, it's your job to, to make sure you're preaching the Word of God. Not your opinions, what you think or what you feel. But, you know, you can use books, you can use Illustrate, do all the things. But you need to make it your job to impart to people God's moral code, His ethical standard, and exactly what He has written here. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, To be diligent. And to present ourselves approved of God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, accurately dividing and handling the Word, studying the Word, being eager uh, to do our utmost to present ourselves to God as a man of God, a preacher who has been approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly, correctly analyzing, accurately dividing, rightly handling, and skillfully teaching the word of truth. When you stand behind this pulpit, <laughs> you, you need to realize the seriousness of, of it because the Bible even says that, that one day uh, uh, we're going to be held accountable. James says, let not many of you become teachers. <laughs> don't, don't just jump in there and say, I want to teach, I'm going to, and don't get up at her tooting your horn about one of because because once you say something, you're going to be held accountable for it. And you need to be careful. If you're preaching false doctrine or you're Preaching greasy grace or sloppy agape and things that aren't accurate, things that aren't true, it's going to boomerang and come back on you and you're going to be held accountable in heaven. And Lord, I've got enough that I'm going to be held accountable for up there. Amen? <laughs> Don't need anything more. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Always be ready to make it a defense or to give an account uh, to everyone who asks me to give an account. For the hope that is in me. I need to be ready. That's not just preachers. Uh, Peter says to, that, that we're to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. And, and that we are all to be ready to, to give an offense. To give an account for, you know, for anybody that wants to challenge or question, question God's truth. I need to be studied and up to speed on what's going on so that... When there's false doctrine or different things, I need to jump up and say, hey, that ain't right. I need to be ready to stand up. You know, we, uh, I like how this week Ty, Ty was, you know, uh, Tuesday morning, I'm getting supposed to preach that night, and I'm not feeling too good, so Ty, can you handle it? And he's like, oh, I don't know, but he jumped right in there, and he was ready in season and out of season. And I appreciate that. I mean, he, with fear and trembling, but he jumped right up there and did a great job, didn't he? I was, you know. Ty, you did a good job if you're watching it tonight, buddy. We appreciate that. But, you know, we're to, we're to preach God's Word when it's pleasant or unpleasant. When we preach the true Word of God, it, it, should, it should go out like a knife. <laughs> it should not return void. It should penetrate. It should, be, it should be more like a bazooka or a, an atomic warhead. And, and it says, uh, Isaiah, and we're going to talk about this next week, God says his, God's Word never returns void. It goes out, and it goes out like a knife, and it's going to land where it's supposed to land. It's not going to return, and when it hits, it, that person that receives has got to do something with it. The truth is the truth. Some people say, well, what is truth? And that's the attitude out there. Well, you better learn to, you better find out pretty quick, because <laughs> one day you're going to be held accountable to it. But that's, that's a, that, that's a no-excuse response. <coughs> God's given us His Word. <coughs> this is the foundation. <coughs> <laughs> we base everything that we believe. My whole ministry, everything we run, is based on this Bible. And I believe it's God's, breathe, God's Word. It's been given to me. I pre try to preach it the best I can and, and uh, you know, preach the truth. And people are going to have to do what they need to do with it. But, uh, so I'm going to study and I'm going to show myself approved uh, as, a, as a preacher of the Word. So... You know, the truth is the truth. You may say, well, I don't believe in the truth. What it, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe. <laughs> Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true. You know, uh, you know your lack of faith or belief in the Word of God does not, uh, that, that faithfulness doesn't nullify and make ineffective and void the faithfulness of God's Word or the truth. And you can suppress the truth all day long. We talk about Romans where it talks about 
uh, the, the moral indictment, the judgment, the wrath of God that comes against people that uh, made a decision to, to choose darkness over light. Yeah, they made their bed, they're going to have to lie into it, and the moral indictment's going to be based on the fact that they tried to suppress the truth. I, mean, I started thinking about that. Trying to suppress God's truth is like trying to hold down an earthquake from happening. You know? You just can't do it. It's just God's truth. It's, it's just amazing. You can deny it and say these things, but God's Word is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's powerful, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. God's Searching and looking for people, not just preachers of righteousness, God's moral code, God's ethical standard, His principles, and He needs people that will stand up for it. For the time will come, verse 3 says, a time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. They won't endure wholesome instruction, looking to have their ears tickled. For something that is pleasing and gratifying, they will gather to themselves one teacher after another in a considerable number, choosing to satisfy their own likings and foster their own errors they hold. They will turn aside from hearing the truth, the divine truth, wander off into myths and man-made fictions. Uh, but the truth is the truth. You know, there's people today, I call them bunny believers. You know, they like jumping from church to church. They like that hyper grace teaching out there that oh God loves you God's not holding your sins against you and, and all that has truth but it's not the whole truth God is merciful God is love but God's a God of judgment he's a God of wrath too you keep playing around with God and keep playing these games and shenanigans you're going to find out what the judgment is and there's a seriousness about people that suppress the truth the, the end result is a depraved mind or a life of debauchery is a depraved mind or a reprobate mind that means a mind that's been abandoned by God he turns you over and says look you, want, you think you got the truth? Go knock yourself out. Do whatever you want to do. You're on your own. And the devil loves to just get his hands on people like that. <coughs> so people like to, like, they like to jump from church to church. <coughs> they like to have preachers that will tell them what they want to hear versus what they need to hear. They like to have their ears tickled. You know, but they really, really, really don't know want a truth. They want the truth up to a point, but they, they want it to build around their life so they can continue to have sex before marriage and smoke a little pot and do different things. <coughs> and that's not okay, is it? All right, so let's turn to Hebrews 12. <coughs> Tonight we're going to talk about the two-edged sword. <clears throat> I've been planning to do this for six weeks now. And it just so happens, you know, Lance is on to the quickened word on Sunday. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we'll move on and skip. And the Lord says, no, no, no. He says, the fact that you and Lance are colliding at the same time is, is a confirmation proof. So I don't know what's going on, but I, I, we need to hear what needs to be said tonight. So, Lord, help me. Help me to impart this about the two edges. So, the two edged sword uh, is talking about the logos or the written word versus the rhema word. And tonight we're going to talk about the two edged sword from a point of warfare. How many know we're in a war out there? The devil doesn't like you, he hates you. He can't stand you're in Liberty Lodge. He can't stand you're going to overcome us. He can't stand for you to be in the Word of God. He wants you to stay in darkness. He hates it when you pray. He hates it when you read the Word of God. He just hates, hates everything. Because, you know, you, you, we used to be a part of the devil, right? We were like Van Halen, running with the devil. But now we're running with the king. And uh, he's not wanting to let us go that easy. Most of us, it took years to finally break away, didn't it, Jay? And me too, all of us. But we ain't running with the devil. We're running with the king. But uh, the word of God, uh, you know, no weapon formed me against me will prosper. But I'm going to have, the devil's going to form weapons against me. <laughs> okay, he's going to do that. He hates me. He wants to take me out. But they don't have to prosper. And we're going to talk about some things tonight about how not to let that happen. How to fight warfare. And in verse 12... <laughs> Uh, of Hebrews 4.12. We don't know who the, the writer is, but most likely it's Paul. <clears throat> it 
says, for the word of God. Word there is our word Logos. It's referring to this Bible. Is living, active, and sharper, sharper than any two edged sword. And it's piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and it's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The Amplified says it's penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, of the soul, and the immortal spirit. That means what is of the spirit, what is of the flesh, what is healthy, what is unhealthy, what is true, what is untrue. It goes down to the joints and the marrow, even into the deepest parts of our nature, into our character. It exposes, it sifts, it analyzes, it unravels, it judges the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. <coughs> that dynamic of what the Word does there <coughs> is about... Recovery, okay. That's how we're gonna. We're gonna talk next week about how the Word of God helps us to recovery because it takes care of <coughs> helping us understand what's going on in our head and what's going on in our emotions. <coughs> so it says that the, the the Word of God, or the Amplified, says the Word that God speaks. Okay, there's a the difference. You got we've got the the written Word that we have for our instruction it's our guideline it's God breathe but 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 when this word comes along and it becomes what God speaks out of his mouth then that word we're talking about a, a transformation we're talking about a transfiguration we're talking about a shift of something that, that happens when we read the, the Bible the word of God the written word <coughs> that God speaks when he speaks it it becomes rhema and it becomes living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword the word that God speaks, it, it becomes alive, full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. This, this book, to a non-Christian, is just a book. He can read it all day and get knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. But without the Holy Spirit transforming it and changing it, into the living word, it's just a book. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit, so it's just a book. He can read a lot. He can memorize. I know people that, that have memorized entire books of this Bible, but it's made no change in their life. You know, they can quote it and quote it all. I mean, you know, the devil can quote this thing. <laughs> okay? And, uh, you know, it hasn't changed them. But for us, this book is, is, uh, is alive. Isaiah says that my word will, which goes forth, my, it, my word will not return void. It will not be empty. It's going to accomplish what it's desire. It's going to hit its target. It's going to succeed in the matter and the purpose for which I sent it out. <coughs> so let's look at this word two-edged. <coughs> if you remember in Revelations 1.16, John's on the island of Patmos. Horrible place. Prison, basically. An angel of the Lord shows up. Basically Jesus. And it says, In his right hand he held seven stars. Seven stars in his right hand. But out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in the stream. You know, and, and you think about it, why Why was... Why was the sword not in his hand? Why was it coming out of his mouth? A two-edged sword. Now that word, uh, two-edged is the word distimos. It's, it actually means two mouths. I was thinking, you know, about a, a two-edged sword. Why would anybody want a single-edged sword? <laughs> Maybe somebody has an answer for that. I don't know. <laughs> but... A two-edged sword, it, you know, it, it cuts you this way, and then it cuts you this way. It cuts you this way, it cuts you this way. You know, you can stick it and stick it and stick it, you know. Uh, uh, but, but this word distimus, it, it literally means uh, to come out of God's mouth, and then for it to come out of our mouth. Now the sword here in 412 is the word uh, uh, markaria, 
which refers to a smaller dagger, but, but the, the rough mia is, is probably a sword uh, a lot like this one. Okay, I think Lance hit on this Sunday, you know, uh, uh, going out to battle, you know, the people, the first thing that, if you remember right, Goliath, when he went after David, the first thing he did is throw through his javelin. You know, he ducks. Okay, so if you hit him with the javelin, game over, right? Go home. You don't have to get dirty. You don't have to get messy. But that don't work. Then you got to pull out this, right? <laughs> then you, then when you go in there, you, you still, you know, this is more like a sledgehammer. Okay, you know, it's just brute force going and coming and going. You know, and if that doesn't work, then you, you know, you you come in with with uh, with uh, this type of sword, which is the Makari, which is more of the 18 inch. This is used for hand to hand combat when you get in close. You know, when that doesn't work, when you're all up in this thing, now now you've got to do some kung fu fighting, baby. You know, you you know you're, you're slicing and dicing, you're jabbing, you're, whatever it takes. But this thing is at that point it's it's living and active. The game's on, and and, and it's incredibly incredibly powerful. So how this how this works? Let's let's talk about how this sword thing works. Okay. God has given us His Word, His truth. And He's called me to preach it, hadn't He? But I can't preach it and I can't herald it, I can't claim it if I don't know it. So I've got to be a student of the Word, don't I? I've got to show myself approved. I've got to get into the Word. If I'm going to stand up and give it a defense and preach the Word of God and stand against the devil and all these, then, then I need to, to know the Word of God. So God gives us this Bible. And as I seek God, then I get into His truth. And this is the Logos. The written Word. But for the Christian now, for the Christian who has, has the Holy Spirit living in his heart, as we take in this Word into our head, it goes down into our heart and there's a, there's a, a transfiguration, a transformation or shift. Something, something amazing happens, but only for the Christian. God's Word unites with the Holy Spirit and brings the quickened word. Okay, the word rhema actually means the spoken word that, that is spoken in our heart. God speaks to us now in our heart, right? It's His, um, it's his experiential word. When this word begins to, to, when we read it and it begins to move in this 18-inch journey... As it moves, uh, something begins to happen. There's a transition where it shifts from a Logos word to a Ramus word, and it becomes, all of a sudden, it, it begins to, it becomes energized. It becomes active. It becomes living and sharper than a two-edged sword. Uh, as we apply it, as we take it in and we apply it and put it in practice, this is why we need to be doers of the word. We're going to talk about this. Yeah. As we take in things that are true, as it moves down, then it becomes truth. And then it becomes experiential. We buy into it, we embrace it, we apply it. We don't just let it bounce off. You know, we, we act upon the Word of God. James says, be ye therefore doers of the Word. Uh, act upon what you hear. Don't be just hearers only who, who delude themselves. The word delude means to, false, to calculate falsely or to reason falsely if we don't act on it. And so as this Word moves its way down, it, it, it becomes the effective Word. It's the clearly spoken, vivid, unmistakable terms, the undeviled language or revelatory, revelatory speaking of the Spirit that ignites faith that brings us to the point where we know that we know that we know that we know. There's things I know nothing about. There's things I know some things about. There's things that I know quite a bit about. And there's some things that I just know that I know that I know. 
This Bible is, is the Logos, it's the written Word, but when, but when I take this Bible in, and I begin to meditate on it, and the Holy Spirit begins to minister and talk to me, and that rhema Word that drops in, that jumps off the page, that leaps, that, that speaks in my heart, sometimes it just go, I know that I know that I know that I know. And there's nothing you can do or anybody else can say. And this is what we're after. We're going to talk about spiritual reading and, and how to bring it from true to truth and do spiritual reading. Spiritual reading is about how to take the, the written Word of God and apply it. How many know the law of God now is not written on tablets of stone, but it's written on the tablet of our heart? This is why it's not the law, but it's the spirit behind the law. And I want to be real careful when I say this, because don't misquote me here, but the, the rhema word trumps the logos word, okay? The written word is, is the general, overall view of God, who God is, his principles and moral standards. But as, I, as it becomes rhema, then it becomes the spoken word to me. For example, God says, uh, if you marry somebody and you've been married and you don't get reunited and you marry, you've committed adultery. That's the written word. But the, the principle, God hates divorce. But the spirit of the law is that, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's exceptions. And God will speak to you and say, look, you've been in this marriage, you've been getting beat up, you've been doing this, it's time for you to move on, I'm giving you permission. And some people won't agree with me, that's okay. But I believe the spoken word at that point would be, would trump the written word. And God would say, in this situation, I'm giving you permission. Some people might say, well, the Word says that they committed adultery so I can divorce them. So on the same note there, no, you can't. <laughs> they might have committed adultery, but that doesn't... The spoken Word might say, no, I want you to stick it out. I want you to forgive them. You see how I'm talking about tonight? So, uh, so what we're looking for, you know, we read the Word. We want to know the Word. We want to compare everything to Scripture. Everything bounces off Scripture. But that, that revelational Word is how it applies to me in my life at this time. And there's Scriptures that I've read over and over and over again. Okay? That, uh, you know, that they're new. <laughs> you know, they always show me. I was telling Lance last night, I, I, I read something and I've, I've seen it before. And all of a sudden I go, I've never seen the breastplate of righteousness like I saw it today. You know, you know and so, anyway. Uh, so, as that, as that word comes out, and then didn't say I got the devil over here. He's speaking lies. Okay, I've got God's truth. He's got lies. So the devil will come after me. He'll start telling me everything that I'm not. You're a loser. You're no good. You're this, that, and the other. He's quoting things or whatever. Okay, but what it says right here is that as I'm taking in this truth and it comes down and it gets into my heart, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak to me. And I hide. The Word of God in me. So that when the devil shows up, I've got His Word hidden in me. Are you with me? Ready to go. So when God speaks to me, then I turn around and speak Him. And when I get a hold of that raiment, that's when the, the written Word, the Logos, becomes not just a book, but it becomes a living and alive and a powerful book. Effective, fruitful, it's quickening, and then it goes out like a two-edged sword. Uh, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. So... Here I am taking in the Word of God, tucking it into my heart. It's turning into rhema. And then when, when God's speaking to me, I've got all this library, portable seminary, a portable library of stuff of the written Word of God because I've been a student of the Word. I've been studying. I've been in the Word, reading large quantities. It's ready to go. It's like a, it's like a sword in my, my sheath. And when it comes out, you know... Uh, the devil starts lying to me. Then I go up to him, and this side, one side is the written word, one side's the reign of the word. So when the devil tells me I'm, I'm a nobody, then, then I'll say, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I'll hammer him with the, the, the written word. And then I'm going, Yeah, 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 greater is he that is in me than he's in the world. And I come back and I hammer him again. But this time with confidence and an authority. Not just quoting the word, but coming out and that's what we're talking about like the sledgehammer man you know you can just go right after the devil right off the bat and if if that doesn't work when you get in closer and closer 
then you just keep on, keep on, keeping on, and then you, then you pull out this dagger, you know, and then now, now we're in combat. Okay, but this, this, we have this. If you're not a Christian, you don't have this. If you're a Christian but you don't know the Word, you don't have this. But we need to realize the devil's going to come after us, isn't he? Okay, he's going to lie. He's going to say things, and you need to be able to discern accurately what the lie is and what the truth. Okay, and, and how this works... Uh, um, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Let's go there. Everybody with me tonight? You're hearing me tonight. These are my swords. You can't have them. You've got you to gotta get your own swords, okay? I've been letting Lance borrow mine, but it's because I like what he's doing. Preacher of righteousness. And, and Lance went this way too on Sunday. We were talking about Jesus and how he dealt with the, the, the temptation in the wilderness. The devil was tempting him. So in verse 4, uh, the devil uh, says, you know, if you are the Son of God, which is a lie because you just, he, just, God, he just got baptized and God told him from heaven that you, you are my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Right? Truth. But immediately the devil tries to mess up the spoken word of God uh, that came out from heaven, the spoken word, uh, and he gets tested here and the devil immediately tries to come back with half-truths. So he said, well, if that is true, or if, if you are the Son of God, then command these stones to be, come bread. He was pretty hungry at this point. And notice he says, but he answered and he responds, it is written in the, in the Bible. The, 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 you know, Jesus didn't actually have a, a Bible like this, okay? But, but, he, had been, he, but he knew the, the Old Testament. He says, it is written in God's Word, uh, but it's also what God says. That man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceedeth. That's the word rhema. From the mouth of God. You said, Gee, guys, let me tell you how I live my life. <laughs> I get up in the morning, I have my quiet time. I read the Word, I have large quantities of Scripture. Then I put it down and then I go up to the mountain and I sit with the Lord and I say, talk to me. This morning I read this, I read this. I, would you make it alive? Would you quicken it? Would you tell me how it applies to me? Would you? I've got it hidden in my heart. So I'm ready to draw on that information at any time but right now you know let me let me hear you so when he came down into the valley you know and he hear, heard uh, God speak to him he was always listening he said this is how I live my life I don't live on bread and things you can't tempt me with bread he said because the way I live my life my lifestyle the way the habit and pattern of my life is I'm always listening to God okay the word proceedeth means a continual flow habitual flow of words that come from the father Jesus was always in tune with the chief, the potter. I'm the clay, <coughs> you're the potter. <coughs> he was always listening. Now, he had like a CIA little microphone in this thing there, you know, okay? He was walking around and he was observing, he was watching what the Lord was doing, what God the Father was doing, and he saw God working on a certain person that had faith, and he says, Lord, do you want me to get involved in this or you got this? Do you need me? So he listened. God says, yeah, jump in there. They've got the faith. I mean, there was millions of, I'm not millions, but hundreds probably of lepers, and everybody wanted healing, right? How did he know? That's because he had a little thing in his ear. 24-7 direct contact with God. So when the devil, so when the devil, you know, comes at him, uh, you know, he, he, the devil's lying to him, if you are, if you are, and we know three times it is written, it is written, it is written, three, three different lies, and Jesus responds, and this is where uh, Ephesians 6.17 says, And take up the helmet of salvation. <coughs> and the sword or the makaria, that's this one, <coughs> of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, or that, that's the word rhema, which is the Word that God speaks. So Jesus wasn't probably carrying His Bible and 
coming out with his seminary badge, you know, I mean, the devil, you know. But Jesus had, had the sheath, okay? I mean, he didn't really, but just roll with me. <coughs> He'd been sharpening his sword, sharpening his sword, student of the word, large quantities, okay? And he was taking it into his heart. So it was stored up. Listen to what Psalms 119.11 says. Your word, God's word, the word that God speaks. David says, I have treasured in my heart that I don't sin against you. The word treasured means he's stored it up or he's hidden it. He's tucked it away for a uh, rainy day when he might need it. <coughs> you never know when the devil's going to show up. So when the devil started speaking this lie, he, he said, no, 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 that's a lie. It is written. It is written. And this is what God says. And then he pulled it out. You know, and came at him with, with the rhema word. You know, he cut him with the, the written word. He cut him with the, the word of God. And he kept bringing it, and he kept bringing it, and he kept fighting, and he kept fighting. And it says, finally the devil backed off, and he departed until a more opportune time. What does that tell you? The devil's going to be back, right? But this is a, this is a, we have, we have the, the, the sheath, the, the heart that David said he tra stored the word in is, is the sheath. The sheath is, Right here in the heart. And so we've always got to keep this thing polished. We've got to keep it sharp. We keep studying. We keep studying. We keep sticking in here. And then uh, the more you know, the more words you have, the more you uh, come out with one side and you hear and you speak that word, it becomes living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes out more like an atomic warhead. And this is the way we do battle against the enemy. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ... The Word of God, the written Word, let it dwell richly within you. Let it be in your sheath. Let the Word that is spoken, the rhema Word, uh, maybe I got that wrong there. Um, but either way, let that the Word, let's say, let's say it's the spoken Word or the rhema Word, the Messiah, let it have its home in your heart and your minds. And that's what we're going to talk about. Let it dwell, let it settle down in all of its richness as you teach and admonish and train one another. So we have to be diligent in the Word. Now how many of you like to be successful in this Christian life? Okay. I don't know about you, but I've been a student of the Word. For some reason I was dumb as a rock growing my IQ. My sister's a lawyer. My brother's an engineer. I'm a, I'm a preacher. I, I just wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. But for some reason, when I got born again, God just gave me a thirst and a hunger for the pure milk of the Word. And I become a student of the Word. And it has literally transformed my life. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. How do I deal with the world? How do I not be conformed to the world, the lies? How do I be conformed and transformed by the Word of God? Because of the truth. So I, I get in the Bible and I read large quantities of Scripture. Washing and renewing my mind. It transforms me. It changes me. It says, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it or because of it, you be changed. This is why the Bible says for a man to get out the Bible and to wash his wife with the Word. I believe he literally means you need to read, take responsibility and beat the devil off of her. Read the Word of God. Wash her. Give her a good bath in the Word of God. And we can bath each other, can't we? But most importantly, we can ba bathe ourselves. Now, the devil is relentless. He's coming after us. So you've got to be prepared. So, you know, you've got to take hold of your sword... <laughs> You got to have something in the investment bank, and then you got to be ready to pull it out and use it. We're in warfare. <coughs> the devil is <coughs> out to kill, steal, and destroy. So, in closing, <coughs> the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword. It's available to us. Now, how's your sword? It's sharp. 